Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us again. I'm Agustina from McNeil Europe and in this Rhino user webinar we have the pleasure to have with us Agustina Alaines. Uh, she will show us the work of her speculative architecture studio called NAR, which stands for Artificial Nature and Natural Architecture, in which they investigate the relationship between nature and computational thinking used in conceptual and applied design. She's an architect and designer with extensive academic experience. She specialized in parametric design after graduating as an architect from the University of Buenos Aires, where she was later head of practical work on architectural design projects. After receiving a full scholarship, she moved to Los Angeles to study the Master of Science in Architectural Technologies at the Southern California Institute of Architecture, where she graduated with honors and she has been a professor of speculative architecture and experimental urbanism. Agustina has also taught computational thinking at the University of Los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, and the final project of the design degree at the University Torcuato de Tela in Buenos Aires. She has also participated as a juror and has lectured at several international institutions. Feel free to use the chat at any time, and at the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Agustina to answer you. So welcome, Agus, and whenever you're ready. Thank you, Agus. We're both Agus. It's a very common name in Argentina. Thank you very much, Rhinoceros Europe, of course, for this beautiful invitation. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and having such a nice audience. Um, so, well, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you. Um, I mean, first we're gonna start with an introduction of what is NAR, what I intend by by NAR, the name of my uh, speculative office studio. Um, what is that interests me so much about nature and architecture and how uh, thinking about it in in parametric uh, terms helps me to actually move from nature to design and from design to nature back and forth. Um, so that would be a little bit of what we were go we we're going to be talking in the beginning. Then I'm going to show you a couple of projects. Uh, probably, I don't know if it's going to be too much or not. I'm just going to put um, a couple of ideas or images or, or just concepts on the table. Um, just, I don't know, to, to, to have a conversation, I hope, in the end. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to start and, and feel free to, to just throw any questions, comments, anything you would like to, to discuss in the, in the end. I'm going to hide a little bit, have all the names there. That's fine. Um, so, well, uh, my name is Agustina Lainas, as I've been beautifully introduced. Uh, NAR is the name of my studio, and our sort of motto uh, is that we design sensitive systems. Uh, what we understand by sensitive systems is something that I'm going to repeat uh, several times. We don't aim on producing final results of a specific object, just focusing on, on the singularity of it but we are interested in designing systems, designing the process of design, which is what uh, Grasshopper in a way allows us very, very well to do because what we design is the process, uh, it's the definition. And from there we can, we can produce or get different outputs, which they stand for, for possible results, which in reality, they're absolutely infinite, which is what, what um, interests me the most. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go back to this system things. Uh, well, this is the introduction. This is this is in Spanish. We're trying to to uh, be bilingual here. <laughs> um, but basically, what this this probably you already read it. It was this idea of why Galileo Galilei said that nature is written in the language of mathematics, and this uh, this has to do what I, what I was just. Uh, mentioning the fact that we can parametrize or find rules, find numbers, find uh, geometries, patterns, systems again in nature that we can, without, of course, the, the magnificency of, of nature that we can in a way reproduce inside a computer in order to create these new, um, these new systems, right? I mean, I, I, I usually talk about um, 
uh, I'm gonna go there now. But I mean, natural NAR, what, what it means is natural architecture. We take the NA and the R from natural architecture, but at the same time in Spanish, it means naturaleza artificial, which is artificial nature. So it's this uh, little game with the NA and the AR to try to create like this sort of connection between uh, what I consider to be the sensible world and the reason um the mind world let's say i mean or or in a way also more artificial so in this in this scheme uh and i have here this this little symbol that actually it's it's not only the command uh on on your keyboards on mac but it actually means that it's an interesting place like you could find in maps this little symbol and it means uh that there is an interesting place there to be to be visited or to be discovered. So that's a little bit why I like to think more on these terms uh, than, than thinking that, I mean, this, this to me doesn't stand to a, to a new infinite symbol, but it's, it's actually regulating these connections of the sensible world where we can find nature under the subject's line and under the modifiers, the natural. And on the reason, uh, on that side, we have architecture and the artificial, and how we, of course, can have na natural nature, let's say, which is, I mean, everything that you just find around that it's created by nature, and we humans tend to create artificial architecture. So I'm wondering what would be to create natural uh, natural architecture, which would be this connection, and what would be to create artificial nature, which would be this connection here. So, sort of creating this these bridges between the the sensible um, side and the and the more reason. <laughs> I mean, something that it's a little bit more structured, let's say. Um, so part of part of that, I mean, it's again, this is a text in Spanish. So so when you have the recording. Um, we have both, but I'm going to translate it a little bit. I mean, part of, of what I've been wondering about is if we can treat architecture in the same way we treat nature, if we can ask ourselves the same questions that nature seems to give uh, answers to, if architecture can also try at least to, to give some answers to it. So some of the questions is, if space can actually born instead of just being developed and dying. So if it can actually have uh, a development of getting born, reproducing, growing up, and then uh, not dying in the sense of demolishing it and creating uh, trash in the world, but actually just having like a close cycle uh, when it can go back and be again part of architecture or part of um, nature. Then if, if a place can actually grow instead of getting built, if it can disintegrate and transform, and if I, if, and, and we have a no here, uh, if it can or not, or, or avoid in reality, if it can avoid uh, interacting with its context, right? Because sometimes architecture just seems to be placed there without uh, much, um, I don't know, uh, sensitivity in a way or relationship with its context and, and we we think it's all about the context and all about the nature and that they should both become become one in reality uh so this this chart here it's actually um this is of course a little bit theoretical and almost a game in a way because this is very much up to discussion but uh in here we have the different kingdoms of the natural world I mean, I put five here. It's all the time under discussion. If there are five, six, seven, they, they keep on subdividing them and creating more. But here we have the, the main five, let's say. And we added architecture here. And we try to think if we can uh, understand or interpret architecture in the same terms that all the other natural kingdoms are actually uh, define or structure, which has to be with their, their nutrition, their cell organization, the cell types, the breathing, their reproduction, and the movement. If we can ask ourselves, what is the nutrition of architecture? How are it, the cells organized? What is the type of them? Does it breathe? Does it reproduce? Does it move? So all these things are little little questions that we ask ourselves and that we try to, of course, not all of them at the same time, but try to um, I don't know, touch base on them a little bit on 
on the different projects that we work on. Um, then this is this is a drawing uh, that two of my students did, Florencia Gramalia and Jennifer Cecilia Yo, for uh, a workshop, an international workshop that we did with other universities. This was made in University of Buenos Aires under Cátedra Diegues. Um, and the, the workshop was called Non-Fictional non -fictional Cities. So it was in the middle of the pandemic. Everybody was, of course, very much in, in that mood. And this was a little bit the, it was trying to represent the idea that we have this world with these broken pieces and they don't seem to fit anymore. It, it feels more like, like planet Earth is, is, is under so much compression, like if gravity was becoming uh, stronger and stronger and so all these little pieces and these little pieces this is like like a clock where some of them become they, they are part of ocean architecture animals humanity nature and we have a lot of different subcategories tiny tiny in there so it's how all these pieces of this sort of puzzle they don't seem to fit anymore so as architects I think we have uh, a, a, a huge responsibility to be able to uh, put together these pieces again, but nature should be at the head of it. I mean, if if not, I think that the pandemic between other things, climate change, etc., has shown us uh, what the consequences might be. Um, so then I, I know that sometimes, uh, not, not sometimes, always, <laughs> nature uh, enters by the eyes because it's basically beautiful and attractive and colorful and full of patterns and a lot of lots of things that we naturally as humans feel attracted to so these are some of of some pictures that i took at the botanical garden in london uh last year and we're gonna see again these these slides in a couple in a couple of slides but with a zoom in right because what we are mostly interesting is it's not what we see at first glance of nature but everything that it's hidden behind it in order to be able to become this beautiful because in reality nature it's not beautiful because it wants to be beautiful in a in a in a selfish way let's say but it's it's mainly because beauty in nature has always a function uh even if it is just to attract an insect in order to to get pollen or seeds from one from one place to another i mean it always has uh has a function and that is what what attracts us the most um Speaking about beauty, and because we are at this time, I mean, I couldn't just avoid uh, putting some of the, which probably you've seen all over Instagram, all over the internet, but they're way too beautiful, uh, of the James Webb Space New Telescope of NASA. Um, and the fact that we are able to see and to develop these sort of images filled with so much information, it's its just like majestic. Um, and, and this is an infrared, uh image so we are now being able to see much more uh, apart from the distance of course in in time and space uh but we are able to see much more than what the nude human eye can see and that is that is something that i'm i'm extremely interested in as well i mean and and you will see now when when i go uh Past <laughs> to the to the to the projects that we that we work a lot with, with what the eye cannot see, even if it is like a telescope idea or if it is a microscopic idea. The fact that that we humans are inventing, I mean, since I mean six centuries ago, right? But that we have been inventing these machines, this technology that is helping us to connect in a in a farther way. Uh, to, na to nature and to understand it, it's it's just amazing to me, and and we love to work with those kind of inputs. Um, so this is this is a slide uh, the slide I was just mentioning when we actually when we zoom in we start discovering that it's not about natural beauty only, but it's about structural systems. Like we start finding these patterns, these different textures, these different structures, these different rhythms, these different colors, and all of this it's for a reason. So that's that's what we uh, aim to work with. And as I was mentioning before, I was, I was talking about natural systems and how um, parametric design allows to design uh, definition, which, which is um, designing the process, but not designing the results, but actually designing a process that it's basically a set of rules that by connecting one, uh, one command or battery with the other one, you set like, 
like how information it's going to be developed and transformed by each command. And then you have on one side the inputs and on the other side the outputs, right? So if you change the inputs, if you if you change a slider or whatever, all that that um, all that process, all that definition, that that system that we created, it's gonna it's gonna give us back different outputs. Uh, that's the, the 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 I don't know the marvelous of of computers, the marvelous of of being able to work with technology. That they it, the technology can create much many uh, outputs and and results that we can in a fraction of the time. Uh, that if we were just doing some of them like three D modeling them by hand, uh, which of course has other 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 options or, or things to explore. Uh, but for example, in nature, this happens a little bit the same. Like these are um, ice flakes and snowflakes. And in nature, I mean, you can imagine how many snowflakes are there. Of course, they're infinite, but they're also all infinite in their sense of design. Like if we are looking at them through a microscope, uh, you cannot find two that are actually the same. It depends on the water, it depends on the te temperature, it depends on the atmosphere, it depends on a lot of things. And actually when a snowflake is falling, it can actually change its design and structure while it's falling and arriving to earth. But if you can observe, they will always have like six uh, points or legs and the structure is always the same. So we could easily develop a system um, to, to always recreate and then just add these little tweaks that give us different results. Um, in that way, we, I mean, we, we admire nature so much. <laughs> I think that's clear. Uh, and we have created like this sort of, um, this sort of diagram where we were talking about how nature has its velocities, its efficiency, its specificity, and in the, in, 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 in the, in the intersection of, of these different words, we have velocity and specificity. That's because of experience and evolution. The specificity and efficiency, they depend on context. The velocity and efficiency, it's through technology, through natural technology that that is, that that is achieved. So th this is also a little bit of a Bible for us when, when trying to, to study this, um, these different projects. Basically, this text says that we believe in nature <laughs> and everything should be informed by the context, the time, uh, everything that we have around to be able to, to develop the projects that we develop and that it's not only intelligence, but it's our intuition, natural intuition. That nature, of course, is it, it is smart, yes, but it's, it's naturally intuitive because of the thousands and millions of years of evolution. And regarding technology, what we think is that technology is here, the use, the proper use that we should give technology is use technology to save nature. So nature can still save the world <laughs> if, if we can still do that. Um, so I'm going to jump to, to different projects. I'm going to um, just show a couple of them. As, as I said before, to put a lot of ideas on the table, maybe I'm not going to go that deep in each of them. Um, this is a project called Unexpected Aspects of Control, which has to do with what, which, what I was just mentioning about designing a system, designing a definition, designing the rules of a, of, of a design and not the final um the final object and and how that opens um that opens the scenery to the unexpected right which i think it's what i love the most about this process is i mean many many times i've been working with a definition and just moved the slider connecting something differently and said whoa how how did that happen and and that 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 what what sometimes is called like a happy mistake right uh, that becomes so powerful in, in design. So this was uh, a project that, um, I think it's not fully charging the page. I'm gonna give it a second. Um, but this is a project that we did in Glorieta Insurgentes in Mexico. Um, yeah, 
here that we did in Glorieta in Surgentes, Mexico. And we also work a lot with the two, two dimensional and three dimensional aspect of our drawings, our 3D models. The point of view is, is something that we that we study very much, how different realities can, can appear or disappear according to the point of view uh, that we are looking through. That that is from a camera point of view, but also like layers of information that can be in the middle of how are we reading an image or a geometry or space. Um, so in here we were just working with this, well, not with this kind of image, but with a with a Google Maps image, which is similar to to. Uh, I'm sorry, this is. I'm gonna stay here. Stop moving from slide to slide. Uh, so these are images that we rasterized and we pixelized in, in Grasshopper in order to be able to read pixels as little pieces of information and then finding vectors that were connecting the, the pixels that were sharing the same color information. So based on that, we started creating these directions in these images. Um, that was that we started on that in 2D. Then we moved to 3D in order to create 3D objects from those lines that were uh, giving us color information from the map, right? So this is like the sort of master plan that we created. Loreta Insurgentes would be this one here and this and some other streets that are connecting there. We were doing like some interventions on different spots around this and the vectors were also creating the sort of bridges that were connecting the different sites with different functions. Um, we created these sort of images that are sort of distorted in a way because we were also working with 3D printing and um, and how 3D printing, I mean, what is the relationship between the analog and the virtual, right? The analog and the digital and how one world can inform the other one and how this information can actually become new input. I mean, if, if we, we used to work a lot, I, I think I don't have images here, but we were sometimes building something, scanning it, getting the information from the point cloud, and then going back with that point cloud information into Grasshopper again, in order to use those coordinates to create new geometries. So that jump like between 2D, 3D, analog and virtual is something that we do a lot. Um, so these are some of the, of the 3D prints that we did in PLA of the different buildings that we were working with. Um, and we decided in this case, if you see there is still some, um, what is normally called the supporting material to be able to print with some machines, some, some use supporting materials, some others, they, they don't need it. Uh, but we decided to use this as part of our design, right? I, I have this image here, um, here. When we printed, in order to print some of these pieces, the machine was actually creating this pattern um, that, that was needed just in order to print what was supposed to be behind, what was supposed to be the final object. But we actually became very interested in the supportive material, in what the machine needed in order to print uh, what we thought we wanted to print. And this became the project in the end. We started like doing some immersive bath tips in, baths in, in ACID. So we were seeing like step by step how the material, the supporting material was melting. And that was also an idea of how could that actually uh, happen in the real world that we have materials that actually they melt. And they, I mean, melt is, is a way of saying they melt, they transform, they evaporate because of their relationship with the context and the weather and the rain and the humidity and, and, and how hot it is. And if it's the sun is there, if it's under shadow or whatever. So how buildings can actually react and be transformed by nature and its context. Uh, this was sort of a presentation we did as a final thesis. Um, I'm gonna go a bit fast on this project because this one here, it's a little bit more on the analog side. We here, uh, we're creating, um, basically we said it's a wooden scarf. This was made by tiny uh, cubes, five centimeter five by five centimeters of uh, wooden cubes. <laughs> they have a hole in the middle and we were basically kneading them like for a week. Uh, and this that you're seeing here, it's like 
30 meters long approx. Uh, we use 10,000 little cubes that we actually called voxels, which is a pixel, but in the 3D space. And we were also at the same time scanning them and creating like what, what I was just saying, right? C trying to, to get back information of the height, of the curves, of the radiuses, of the weight, and how all these things that we were just trying in the real world were becoming uh, new inputs and information of study for a new project that we wanted to do. Uh, of course, the use of color, which were always uh, in relationship with nature about it. And we call these artificial landscapes because it's, it's. I mean, if you just let it lay down, it would be like a very long scarf, um, but it actually can twist and, and revolve around it and it start creating like all these different, um, going to the other side, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is this is a view, a lower view, and it actually starts creating these tiny spaces. And I have to say, it's a very comfortable piece of experimental furniture uh, because it actually adapts to 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 your body because of the tiny little cubes. Uh, and all of this is impossible to repro to re reproduce. I mean, it's it's just a once once in a lifetime result, and it moves. It's it's a system. It's a it's a sensible system, as we were talking in the beginning. So this, this is what it is. Um, and then we did another version and a smaller version for a shop here in, in Palermo, Buenos Aires. Um, so then we have here the, the LA River. This is another project um, we did when we were working uh, with the LA River, which is 50 miles long. Uh, I lived in Los Angeles. I studied there as, as I was mentioned before. So this was a project we, we did there and we were uh, thinking about how the LA River, I mean, I don't know if you, if you know, but the LA River, it was creating uh, flats in, in LA, uh, very serious ones, like two meters high. Uh, in downtown, so they decided to to channelize it, which is the longest river in the world to be to to be to become a, cha a channel. Um, so in some areas, more more in the north of what we were just seeing, it looks like this. But in downtown, specifically in the art district, it actually looks like this, which is very far away from a natural uh, approach to it. It's a channel within a tiny channel. Uh, inside, depending on the on the water level, it actually gets more or less flooded, and that is something that we decided to work with. We said, okay, here the protagonist is the water, so the water for us needed to become um, the object of design, and and actually needed to 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 be the object of design, but the design itself. Uh, take making decisions in a way. So again, we started working from a two D image. We starting. Um, changing it and alterating it based again on some factors of colors, uh, connections that we wanted to achieve and, and trying to, to lose the straight line of the water that we were just seeing, which is like the opposite of, uh, of nature. I mean, nature doesn't move at least at this scale. It doesn't move in straight lines. Uh, so we were, we were wanting to get back to more this side of the, of the channel than this one. And uh, here we're, we're, we, we started creating some pools of, uh, as well uh, that they could actually have some functionality. And at the same time, they could be, um, I mean, functionality from a programmatic point of view, but as well from a structural point of view, because they were slowing the speed of the water when the water was growing too fast. Uh, so that was also a thing. Then we we moved from the 2D images to the 3D world in Rhino, and we started creating all these different layers. And um, it's a bit slow. It works. We started creating all these different layers instead of having like these diagonal walls that we were seeing before and that you probably also have seen in, in a lot of movies. Uh, we decided to create steps. So according to the level of the water, these steps, they were becoming hidden or not, right? They were becoming part of the architecture of par or part of nature. Um, and in that way, this landscape, it's always changing and always evolving. 
Um, the colors are there as well to try to recreate this sort of artificial landscape that because nature it's not uh, a perfect concrete gray, right? <laughs> um, so that was that was part of the idea and allowing the colors to create like a color coding also for programmatic purposes. Um, and this was a little bit more of what we were imagining for the LA River uh, to happen. Um, then the parametric shirt shelter, it's another project uh, that we were, we actually are working on it right now because we, we keep on uh, trying to evolve the projects uh, and take them further. And this was uh, based or inspired in nature foldings, which again, they do have uh, purposes. Like for example, this is a palm leaf that when it, when it grows, it's, it's all folded. So it's like a tiny, uh paper i mean it, it 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 works a lot with the or actually the other way around origami works a lot with nature foldings um ideas and this is how it actually grows until we we see a completely unfolded time leaf uh and we were working with with some sort of those ideas how something it's not actually static uh but it's dynamic and can 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 work at different times and it can have actually different functionalities and different characteristics according to the folding uh, angle that it has. So this is uh, one of the first prototypes that we did in, in paper. Actually, we started paper, then we moved to Sintra and or foam. And, and this is a little bit of the instructions of folding, like, like of the origami paper, finding the diagonals and pushing some of the some of its points in order to start um, in order to start playing with the surface of the of the unit or the module and the height of it. So we, we started studying that proportion. Um, here the blue lines and this is our information as i was saying right that sometimes we start from the analog world and sometimes we start from the virtual world so in this case we started with the models and then we started which which points were the ones that were moving in which way they were moving when the when the this this cell in a way that we were developing was was moving and growing so the light blue lines will be what it's called the valley in origami and the red ones would be the mountains. So if you're actually folding like this or folding like this, um, and then the blue points were the ones that when we were moving from the isolated cell to the system, uh, we wanted them to stay attached, right? And how then the movement of one cell was um, predisposing the movement of the one that, that is actually next to it. Um, Sorry, my, my sliding is not my friend today. Uh, so there was this, this, as I was mentioning, the, the relationship between height and surface or X and Y and Z. And what we, were, what we were trying to achieve is how then if we have these models and they are very, they, I mean, according to the different materials that we're actually uh, working on it right now, according to the different materials that it can be built in, um, it can have different functions when it's fully opened, then it can be a flooring when it's like partially uh, open or folded, it becomes like a topography and you can be under it or above it and it, 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 it can be something a little bit more, um, I don't know, in relationship with nature in a way because it's like creating this, this fake or artificial landscape again or actually when it's completely folded, it achieves the maximum height and you can actually go under it and, and be sheltered by it. So these are a little bit the points, the coordinates that I was just mentioning. So we were working with, uh, we started working with a grid that was our starting point on Grasshopper, uh, just a grid with the points, which in, in this case are F, G, H, and Y, and I. And then how these points, according to the folding that we were just, just seeing, they were having like, uh, sub points, let's say, which are on the IH side, we have C and C1, D and D1, B and B1, A and A1. And then these points, they were just sliding along the two diagonals, F, the diagonal FH and the diagonal IG. 
and how they were all merging together and at the point O, which is at the center, right? So, um, which started as a very intuitive process with the models and the papers and doing trials, et cetera. Then we started like trying to find these parameters um, and, and trying to reproduce those parameters in, in Grasshopper. So this was the Grasshopper screen. Uh, and here I, I put some, some notes of actually how uh, the connections happen between the points that we're just saying. Here in the middle, we have the point on curve command, which is basically all the points they needed at the very end to collapse in this point on curve command because they needed all to move together, right? Um, which is what the what the actual physical model was doing. And yeah, that's a little bit of it without, without getting too technical. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I tried to move faster. So these are some screenshots directly from Grasshopper showing uh, the different stages I was just mentioning when it's completely open when and when it's fully uh, closed or, or folded and two stages in the middle and how uh, the relationship changes. And that was something that these this happy mistakes or unexpected aspects of, of what we think we are controlling because we are in a, in a computer-based environment. Um, but these kind of uh, light entries, we were not expecting, to be honest. Um, I mean, we did the model, but the, we, did, we needed to lighten it in a particular way in order to see it. So we were not that that clear on it, but these that, we, that I have on the on the right side are actually the shapes that I painted here in yellow, uh, which are the open spaces when the, the cells keep on closing and opening, the system actually um, discovers something else, right? And when the cell is just um, isolated, you cannot, you cannot appreciate. So we have all these different and beautiful drawings which become um, light entries in real life. Right. Um, I think I have here some renderings of how it feels to be inside. Um, of course, we we aim to create like systems where they are not all uh, open or closed at the same angle at the same time. So we have like different options and different functionalities of it, um, just like open around. Um, yeah. So just showing some images here. And what we also care a lot about is that this could be used in a, in a very, um, I mean, nice environment or, or, or in a park or in a festival or, or anywhere we want. But the fact that this can be fully flattened, that makes them uh, very easily to transport. So we were also thinking how this, these parametric shelters, uh, they could actually be used in extreme situations, um, any kind of them. <laughs> so, uh, and they could be easily transport, transported and very fast, um, and very fast to put up, right? So, so that's that's also something we were thinking about, and and we are actually studying as well. Um, there <laughs> sorry <laughs> takes a second and and yeah and at the same time we're we're trying to explore some more speculative approach uh for for a 3d development of the system and not only on on one level let's say um then i wanted to show cellular scope this is another project that it has to do with observing uh nature from a very um a very close uh, distance, let's say. Uh, that's why it's called cellular scope because we're actually focusing on the cells. Here we are not seeing cells, but what I wanted to show, uh, it's the Voronoi pattern um, that Grasshopper actually has a lot of Voronoi uh, options to, to explore. And the Voronoi pattern is something that exists in nature and it comes from nature. And it, it means that if we are considering, for example, this that is like a giraffe skin, right? Like if we consider to have a point within each of these areas, we know within each of these enclosed areas, what it means is that if we have a point here and a point here and a point here, 
the distance that that point has from the infinite points that we have on a field or a surface, um, it's like measuring them and then it closes all the ones that are closer to this point will be enclosed in this area. All the ones that are closer to this point are enclosed in this area, which means that if I have a point over these white lines, it's equally, um, the distance is equal from this point to this point here and from this point to this point here. Um, so those are very, very much mathematical approaches, and this could all be measured and reproduced uh, in Grasshopper, and that's what we, what we like to do a lot, right? So these are all different examples from Mother Nature, where we can, we can appreciate the perfect geometries that it creates. I mean, of course, talking about the, the, the bees is just like next level of complexity and beautifully done and perfect from a structural point of view. Um, but we, we were working with this kind of images. These are all human cells on, on the microscope. And we were firstly, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, admiring its beauty, its colors, the structure that it has from a pattern point of view. Uh, so we started working with this. These are not ours, I want to say. <laughs> I don't have the merit of, of those images. Um, but then we started like vectorizing them and trying to find the geometry behind them, trying to simplify, of course, the, the images that we were working with in the beginning, finding, again, the color coding, trying to apply functions to them, meaning to them. And then we started working with Grasshopper um, in order to optimize all of this, right? Because a lot of times we also use Grasshopper when we're coming from very intuitive world, so or, or very, very high in complexity. Sometimes what we need is to just simplify them uh, in order to be able to work with that data, with that information. So we need to, to yeah, simplify it in a way, just make it more approachable. Um, so that is that is the process of optimization that we do. Uh, so everything that has one color becomes a similar geometry. Sometimes everything that has the same size, the same area, the same proportions, it becomes the same uh, the same type of cell, let's say, the same type of, of, of piece within a system. Uh, so this was part of that. Um, I, I didn't mention that this is a project we did with Galileo Morandi. Um, and, and then we, we move from this kind of drawing, optimized drawing, uh, back into, back into Rhino in a way to, to start, I mean, Grasshopper and Rhino, of course, they work together, but sometimes we work more in Grasshopper for studies, then we will go back to Rhino and, and make some human-based decisions, right? Like we are more interested in this kind of approach or this kind of approach, and then we go back to Grasshopper, re-redefine the definition uh, and go back and forth all the time. Um, so this was some of the these were some of, of, of the um, artificial landscapes that we were creating in a way. Um, then we move again from 2D to 3D. We started finding some different patterns, different behaviors that these, that these cells could, uh, could adopt in the, in the 3D world. We did some 3D printings. Uh, these are in powder. And, and then we started thinking about I mean, this was all very abstract in a way in the beginning. So we were thinking about, okay, what, what can this be, right? I mean, um, according to the scale that we, that, we, that we give or that we, that we decide to interpret these models or these drawings or these 3D models, um, then the functionality we change. Uh, are they still microscopic, supposed to be microscopic? Are, are they huge now? So this was one of the, of the different uh, approaches that we were doing. I think I have here open. Yeah, um, this print, this page didn't print, I'm sorry. So that's why I'm showing it from here. But these were also like different options. Uh, if this was like an installation in a park, if they were working as tiles, if they were part of a more speculative uh, working environment, an installation or whatever. So that's what we, what we like to do, just allow the process to develop itself. And at one point start like making, uh, making decisions on our own based on what the, the process gave us. Um, and then I think this is one of the, this is the last one and I'm 
sort of good on time, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the natural fields. And, and this, is, this is a project that actually uh, I did a tutorial on, on this specific image uh, for Digital Futures World. Uh, we're gonna send you the link later if, if you actually are interested in a, in a very much uh, technological approach to this. That one is in Spanish, but I think you have the, the subtitles available. Um, so this is, this is basically what we, what we sort of call these artificial natures or artificial creatures. Of course, this is farther from, um, from architecture in a traditional way, or as I was saying, it's a, it's a stage before us actually giving meaning and starting deciding how to interpret this, uh, these objects in an architectural way. Um, and here I was working with different fields that, again, the, the, the inspiration was coming from natural fields. These are all butterfly wings. And, and we can start seeing how color again and size and patterns and, and structure, they, they start creating like different areas. So we wanted to work with that. We wanted to discover what were the, the hidden rules of these areas, finding like the different diameters, understanding that there is a tiny ball after a pipe and that all those pipes are connected to a center and where is that center and how many pipes um, do we have. So uh, trying to find the relationships, like the hidden relationships that they're just there <laughs> in nature. We, we just need to explore them a little bit. Um, these are our sea stars. And again, we can find like we have a center that we have like five uh, five legs coming from that center. So, and all of them, they have like a smaller scale. If we, if we observe like uh, closer to, to these edges, we have um, smaller cells and then they become bigger. And that happens in all these three pictures. So we, we do this of finding a lot of, a lot of examples try to read the geometry in them, trying to find these parameters again, uh, the rules that, that actually um, relate all these parameters, and then try to reproduce all that system in, in Grasshopper or sometimes in a model, as I was saying. Um, so yeah, all, all examples of natural fields. This again is, is directly uh, a screenshot of one, one of our definitions and how we 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 use color, um, and then yeah, these are some screenshots of how we are um, interpreting or or trying to play with whatever surface we want. That would be one of the inputs created in Rhino or not, or just created in Grasshopper with a different kind of of system. But starting the points on the surface, they're working with finding the directionality of those starting to create these points that attract other points. And this would be the beginning of a Boronoi field, as I was mentioning before. You can see that all these points are connected to this one because they are they they have the closest distance from this point to this one instead of this one or this other one, which would be like the points A, B, C, let's say. Uh, this is sort of way better explained in the <laughs> in the very slow tutorial that we did. Um, but it starts creating, I mean, as inputs, we have a surface and then we have the what we call the part. And this part, of course, can be whatever. Again, that's one one of the one of the inputs. We were working with a little uh, sort of, I don't know, water drop or something in this case, but it could be whatever. And we started playing with scale, we started playing with color, we started playing with the directionality of it, uh, with the distance of them, of course, with the amount of points that we want to have in that read that we were seeing in the beginning, how many attractive points, which is something that if 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 some of you are familiar with Grasshopper, it's very, very common to work with uh, the attractor points. So all of these things that were sort of working together, um, adding more and more uh, mathematic relationships. I mean, sometimes we're just doing literally a division inside. Um, and then this is another project also done uh, in Grasshopper with Python inside Grasshopper as well uh, of these artificial natures that we're creating that again, they're nothing yet, probably in the metaverse, it will be easier to give them some um some functionality but again the kind of of approach that we do uh how we work with Voronoi with SubD how the projections work in Python then using uh a mirror cut mesh uh approach and everything um I mean this is all 
this is all very intuitive, but at the same time, it's all very planned in a way, or, or both things happen at the same time, some way. Then some other, these are some exercises I did for the computational thinking course I was, I was given in the University of Bogota, University of Los Andes in Bogota. Um, and well, and I just decided to finish with, with this image because it was the one that I gave as a cover. Um, and I think it, it has inside a lot of the concepts that we were just, just mentioning, but still in an abstract, at an abstract point, which, which is probably my favorite because it's, it's, it's nothing yet. It's not nature. It's not architecture. It's like something in between in a digital environment that, that I love so much because it has all these open possibilities. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, here is some contact information in case you want to reach out. I love to uh, get in contact with, with you. And I think Agus, you are still there around. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> that was amazing. I really, really enjoy um, really good pictures. And um, we have some questions if you if you're up to answering them. So first, um, again, thank you so much for that. It's really good. No, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> no um, so we have Fabian. Uh, he asks. He does really beautiful work. And what? I'm oh, sorry. That's about if it's been online. And then we have Harman Pritt. Um, he asks, can we have that in human body too, just like you described in the C star? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, one, one project in the, at the end um, or before was cellular scope. Those were all, uh, they're called histologic cuts because of, of, of actual uh, muscles and parts of organs. And you know that our cells, they actually behave in different, they, they are shaped in different ways and they have different uh, like muscle cells, how they're very long and some other cells, they are more uh, rounded. I mean, I'm just talking in a very basic way here, but how nature, it's always, it, it always has a functionality related to the geometry and the structure that it proposes. So we can absolutely study literally i mean anything anything we want at different scales um that's why i also like to work with microscopic images because they offer us like another level of of information and complexity and 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 it's just i mean amazing because we don't see that with the naked eye right um but yeah we can we can we can do that kind of study with literally anything i mean anything that belongs to the natural to the natural kingdoms that i was mentioning in the beginning even studying like mushrooms um that now fungi they're very on fashion which i love it's okay it doesn't matter that it's probably a trend it's a it's a, one of the best trends ever it's, it's a good um, trend it's a good Beautiful. trend yeah but talking like about mycelia, talking about all those networks that are creating underground, I mean, even that it's something that you could try to, to find the, the patterns, right? They, they discover these parameters and try to get them back into the digital world and reproduce them for whatever you want. Um, thank you for the answer. Uh, we also have Florencia. She says, when talking about input, output, and coming back and forth from in, an intuitive approach to a more mathematical or parametric point of view, would you say that rhino and grasshopper are more than just means to an end? It seems more like a way of translating these projects. How would you describe it during the design process? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I need to read that again. <laughs> um i mean i always i always i mean all, all these projects were done with rhino and grasshopper um i also do a lot of photoshop of course and a lot of a lot of illustrator as well because we work with vectors uh and with images and everything um but in the end, I think all softwares, they sort of work together, you know? I mean, I always say, especially to my students when they say, okay, but this project, I need to do it in, in this software or that software. I mean, it's not like that. It's actually, I mean, different kinds of projects, they do sometimes need to use different softwares. But to me, it's more about 
the stage of the project. Like in the beginning, you will probably be working or, or us in the beginning, we're probably working more on a 2D environment. So we're working on Photoshop, we're working on Illustrator, we're working on Rhino, but from a top view uh, angle. And then we start parameterizing some things. And then we go to Grasshopper. And as I mentioned at one point, then we abandon Grasshopper for a while. We make human decisions based on all the options that Grasshopper gave us. We um, yeah, we make human decisions. I mean, we 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 say, okay, beautiful, but I don't need, for example, with the with one of the um, or the cover image of 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 the webinar, right? That we were having all these different drops. I mean, sometimes I delete one drop that I don't like. I enlarge one because I'm interested in that. Of course, that then you have like a post editing moment, right? And then you go back to Grasshopper. So I think they're all tools. Uh, we need the tools. I mean, in the same way that we were talking about the telescope or the microscope, those those are also tools. Uh, but I think it's important that we are um that we're working with the tools and the tools are not working with us you know what i mean i mean sometimes a project is like oh this was done in that in that software or software or in that software and in that in those cases i think the language of the surface is becoming stronger than your own language so that is that is something that i always try to to i don't know not not allow myself to get seduced by some things and and what i love about about grasshopper is that Point one, I mean, it's sort of open source in the sense that you can keep on adding more and more plugins to it from Food for Rhino, which probably you you guys all know. <laughs> um, and you can also have processing Python, I mean, coding options inside of Grasshopper. So if there's something that you are not being able to do with a specific command, or if we don't have a genius that invented a new plugin yet for what you're trying to do, you could also code it inside Grasshopper. So that's that's what I think it's important that, that as I mentioned, that you own the tool and the tool doesn't own you, but we need them <laughs> in the same yes. way you need a pen to write. <laughs> Um, I think um, when they ask if it's uh, a means to an end, it's an um, interconnected, um, it's a tool for an end and also uh, it can give you an answer when you're using parameters. If, Absolutely. If they understand Absolutely. what you mean. And we also have um, a little time for another questions. So, they're um, asking for Navila, this beautiful images, great presentation. I'm super interested in the Winter Soul work. Is there any further publication work that I can look up to it if wanted to know more about it? Um, and also ask um, and about the Winter Soul, apologize if you perhaps already talked about it. Was what, what was the reasoning behind the scale of the structure? both in terms of the voxel dimension and the final configuration. Thank you. Um, well, that Wintersol is it's a project that we did within a context, which was the Hello Wood Festival. Um, Hello Wood, it's a festival that started in Europe and it was brought, brought here to Argentina. Um, and basically we had what I always, always like to, to call inputs instead of conditions of uh, to work with, um, that we have a certain amount of wood that we could use to 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 propose projects for it. it. It started as a competition, and then they picked ten projects, and and we were assigned a group of ten students that were just beautiful students uh, to to actually develop the project that we proposed, um, and that's why we were like on the countryside for a week. Uh, that was the summer exactly like a couple weeks before the pandemic. <laughs> and, and we built that like under the sun for, for eight hours a day. And we were knitting, knitting, knitting these voxels. So actually the size of those voxels was the size of the wood they were giving us. They were just giving us like long pieces of wood that the section was five by five and they were, I think, 12 meters long. And most of the projects that were working with those um with with the wood in in 
in the way that it comes, let's say. I mean, just thinking about it as, as a long object, right? And we decided to actually voxel it or, or, or cut it in cells and start working with them as modules, like creating in a way like little bricks. Uh, because what we wanted to do is assign the wood, which is a hard material, a property of flexibility. So by doing so, by reducing the scale of the, of the material we were given, we were actually able to create a more organic shape, which is what we were aiming up for. Um, so the size in that case was, was coming from the materials that they gave us, again, part of the toolbox that we, that we got. Um, and we, we were able to need 30 meters because we were needing for seven days, which was as long as we were there. So probably if they gave us more days, it would have been longer. There was always the discussion of making it longer or wider because again, it's a system, so it can grow in any direction. Um, the weight at one point became a problem because wood is heavy when, when you have uh, all, that, all that amount of it and all connected. So we needed at one point, like in order to put it on top of that tree and to move the 30 meters of, of wooden scarf or winter sole, uh, we use everybody in the camp. So it was like 50 people or I don't, I don't even remember. I should put that picture in, in one of the presentations, everybody trying to move the scarf. Um, so that was coming from real world, uh, reasons let's say after that we we are doing and and they are not up to at the point to be shown uh testing different materials different scales we did do some smaller scarves with tinier voxels um and we are also experimenting with materials that are lighter which was part of the problem that we that we encounter with with Bintersol. and and there was a question before that um, I mean, she did a, a double question. Oh, just about uh, if there's any further publication or work. So I just uh, send your contact. So yeah, anyone that would be that great. More information about your work, they can contact you freely, I guess. Um, of course. <laughs> Free and, and then happy. <laughs> we have four more minutes, so I'd say for a couple of more questions. So, um. We'll try to be brave to see if we can do them. So Nancy asks, have you been thinking of the structural aspect of these organic forms? And um, Florencia also asks, how do you combine this design process in 3D printing and how is the process of materialization? And I will let you answer, <laughs> and answer one more after and that's... That's yeah. The time we got it. Um, yeah. I mean, how we how we build how we build these things. It's it's always part of the question, right? Like when when you are so immersed in a way in the digital environment, sometimes you you sort of forget that gravity is a thing, <laughs> and that there is a real scale um, a real scale problem. And I say problem in a, in a good way, not as a problem, but as part of the of the challenge that we need to that we need to to answer. Um, but I mean, a lot of these projects, I, I like to keep them more on the speculative side, which is sort of what we do. I mean, I'm more an academic and a speculative than an actual builder. I love to build what we do, like like Bintersol and, and models, and we are working in other prototypes. Uh, and I think that's that's part of me being being an architect. I mean, uh, not being able to forget that I'm an architect uh, uh, with a in the beginning with a very traditional education and then things got, um, the, I don't know, <laughs> a little different, um, more, more speculative and theoretical. Um, but I, I think it's way more important to ask good questions than to give a good answer to them, if you know what I mean. I mean, I consider myself still to be at the questions stage uh, and we're getting there on how to, on how to fabricate these things. Um, and now the metaverse appeared and I'm like, okay, maybe we don't even have to build them. Maybe they can just exist in the metaverse and that's it. Uh, but I'm trying not to, not to fall in that trump. Um, but yeah, and regarding 3D printing, I mean, that's, that's something that, I mean, oh, 
in reality, all digital fabrication, everything that, that comes with it, like CNC milling, uh, laser cutting, 3D printing in all the different materials and techniques that you can explore, robotics. These are all things that we, that we explore. But again, they are still prototypes according to the scale you're working in. Uh, I mean, of course, we, you, we can have a robot 3D printing in concrete, or you can just have your desk size 3D printer and that it's printing your, your tiny prototype. And each scale will give you more problems again and answers and questions in order to develop it to the next stage. Um, so yes, yes and no to everything I just said. <laughs> Well, um, Nancy here says, yes, I appreciate the daring and experimental forms without so much worry about structure. Um, yeah, so I, think, we... I think, so, sorry, I was, I think no, sometimes, no. and this is something I, I say to my students as well, uh, in order to free creativity and in order to be able to explore like new shapes and, and open the spectrum in a way, you need to forget at least for a little while uh, of the questions of, okay, but how, how do we build this? Okay, but what is the material? Okay, but, okay, but, okay, but. Something, sometimes it's just, okay, let's forget about all of that for a second. Let's get to a, to a point where we're comfortable and happy with what we got. And now we ask the questions. And that, that's something we, we do a lot. So I would um, ask the last questions. Um, so we are run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I see a lot of interest here. So that's, that's pretty good, a great feedback. So Hannah asks, how do you exploit principles from natural samples interacting with a group of bionic scientists or what? Um, then Josefina asks, thank you very much, Agustina, for this very interesting webinar. I just wanted to ask for your opinion about something, considering the subjectivity of human interpretation. Do you think that in terms of technology, Gestation, sorry, uh, <laughs> of nature, wouldn't it turn the natural organicity into a forced result? Hmm. Um, okay. Um, well, to the first question, if we work with scientists or, or I mean, in a multidisciplinary way, uh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I mean, it depends on the kind of approach that we want to give. Uh, I'm also very nerd. So every time we are <laughs> um, studying something in particular, I mean, the, the field of study, it's normally very specific. So we just research a lot about that. Sometimes we reach out to somebody, to a professional in the, in the field if we need to for specific questions or not, or an introduction or whatever. Uh, but basically we study a lot the subject that, we're, that we have decided to work with. Um, and from there, as, as I was talking in the beginning, I mean, there is a lot of room for creativity, interpretation, intuition, as the second question was, was mentioning. And, and I think that's, that's also important because, I mean, uh, we, don't, we don't try to be scientists, right? We are trying to find that intersection between design or architecture and, and nature or science and art uh, and technology, natural technology, coming from nature right and artificial technologies created by by us humans so since we're working and interested in 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 that that point of interest that i was mentioning in the beginning of uh the intersection of all these spaces we we can allow ourselves to have some freedom in how we want to interpret these things uh as long as the connections are still there right um, I also think that that projects in the same way that we were talking about the system and the definition and all of these things, uh, projects evolve and, and sometimes you end up with something that you were not uh, expecting or that, I mean, it, it just became a different project and, and that's fine. Uh, I and mean, if, I don't know, we were using a snowflake in the beginning to study something and in the end it doesn't make sense anymore, but it was the starting point, then that's, that's valid as well. Uh, and it will probably be a project more on the side of architecture than on the side of nature. But I think that that what we aim for is respect for nature and admiration and um, yeah, and just just learning from it, learning from it and defending it. 
Yeah, mainly respecting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mainly respecting. Right. Very, very, very thankful for this time spent with you, honestly. And I'm very happy to see such an amazing feedback uh, on the chat. Yeah, I was, I was trying to read the chat as well. <laughs> Uh, like everyone had a really good time actually so i think very very thankful for your time Rose. and i'll see you again soon and thank you everyone for participating absolutely. so i'll see you everyone at the next webinar uh, reno user webinar Bye, I'm, I'm gonna drop my my instagram here so yeah uh, put it on the screen so everybody can reach can out because I think a lot of messages that I'm not being able to answer. Uh, but just drop a message or shoot me an email. I'll, I'm also going to put it here and I'll be super happy to continue all these beautiful conversations and questions and comments that I'm seeing here. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Agus and, and Rhino Saras Yuberop for the invitation. Um, I'm very, very happy with, with being able to do this with you guys. Yeah, me too. Me too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.